in case it's a little bit hard for you to tell, I'm an African. And I'm from, specifically, I'm from Swaziland. Being an African, we are known to be great storytellers. I would like to start you off with a story that my dad told us when I was young. He told us a story that was allegedly from the Bible about a, a man named Noah. According to my dad's story, Noah had two sons, a good son and a bad son. One day, Noah got drunk. He was so drunk, in fact, he, he was just laying there naked. And the best son, realizing what had happened, caught up his friends, made fun of his dad, mocked him. But the good son, being a good son, we know all good sons out there. You grew up with them. He saw his father's nakedness, and out of respect, he decided to cover his dad. Noah learned about what happened when he woke up in the morning. He wasn't happy about it. And as a result, he cursed his son. According to my death story, he cursed the best son to be black and to be a slave to his brother. Now, let, let me take you back. Imagine me, a kid, hearing a story. I'm impressionable. I'm black, so does that mean that I'm also a result of a curse? Now, I can imagine some of you here thinking, is that how really the story is told in the Bible? Spoiler alert, that's not how it's told. But you can imagine a story like that to a kid, what it does. It certainly contributed to my feeling of inadequacy growing up. It wasn't until I was doing my senior year in college in the United States that I got hold of a documentary from a friend from Zimbabwe. She was white. The documentary talked about how the white South Africans used this story to, to justify racism, apartheid, as we know it today. Now, I'm not here to tell you how traumatized I have been in my life, how hard, how hard life has been for me, but I'm here to tell you that I have learned that it's actually possible for, for, for the most part, for, for people to, to outgrow the labels that have been given to them by, by their environment and be something great. Let me bring a bit of some context and tell you about myself. Like I said, I grew up in Swaziland. I'm from a family of 14. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the story of like how that happened, because some... <laughs> <laughs> African stories sometimes have those stories, half brother there, half sister there. My parents were both primary school teachers, and I grew up in the, under, uh, on, in the underdeveloped areas of Swaziland. It's a rural area. My father was a farmer on the side, so let me just give you an idea of what that meant for me. It meant that we just got our, our electricity about two years ago. So growing up, it means our source of you know, heat to, to cook, we got it from firewood that we fetched from the forest on a daily basis, getting a whole bottle of, food of, of firewood. It meant that we had to fetch water from a mile away, which is about two kilometers on a daily basis, a 50 liter bucket for, for cooking and bathing and other things in the house. It meant that in the summer, I would have to wake up, say at 4 a.m. with my family, studying the fields before going to school. Now, I can imagine some of you thinking, so some of you might be thinking, oh, that's a hard life. And some of you might be thinking, ah, I heard a story from my cousin. It was actually worse than this one. And I'm aware that there are actually people out there who have had really rough stories 
and who have amazing stories to tell today. And that's the whole point. Some other people are able to, to make it, despite what, what, like the stories that we hear about them. But m for me, I was, n I was n not one of those. I was just an average student. In fact, I was so average that I, I repeated my last grade in primary school. That was very humbling. <laughs> in, <laughs> just to give you an idea of how average I was, you know how in school you have those students who are always hiding their exam papers during, like, during exams because they don't want you to be cheating of them. I was not one of those. <laughs> My script was just always open. <laughs> I continued being average um, until I, I went to, into high school. High school was an escape from the farm, farm life during the school periods. It allowed me to focus on my school. I was staying in a boarding school. My dad would pick us up from home and take us to boarding school. And then after the semester, take us from, from school and back home. One day, during one of those trips, I found a tape in his car. It was an old Toyota 1990. Um, Hilux van. This tape, I don't know what made me listen to it. I put it in. It was like I have found the thing I have been looking for. It was a motivational tape. It talked about how within each and every individual, there's a sleeping giant. When awakened, that sleeping giant is able to uh, do uh, abundantly more than you can ever imagine. It talked about how God trusted us to, 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 with, with our brain capacity, that he didn't create furniture, but instead he created the forest because he knew we'll be able to figure out how to make furniture. He talked about how he himself, when he needed money, he locked himself in a room started thinking about ideas on how to make money. He needed money in the order of millions. After a considerable amount of time, he said he was able to figure something out, an idea that gave him money to start his business, and even more. Now I'm hearing this. I was at about the age of 12 or 13. I was like, brother, speak no more. <laughs> and from there, I was, I, I, I wonder how is it, it, it would be like for me to aim to be in the top 10 of the country. Imagine from repeating a class to imagining being in the top 10 of the country in my living class in Form 5. In fact, I think I started wanting to be in the top 10 in, in, in grade 9. Started studying, come Form 5, my last grade in high school, I got it. Now, I just made that seem easy. It wasn't easy. I remember a friend of mine that reminded me at some point how I had to work hard more than a lot of people, yet there was a friend of ours that was always beating me. I beat that friend in my last exam. And then finishing my Form 5, I went to college in the United States, where you know, like, I was, I was lucky enough that I was good at math. And at some point, I picked up physics. But I was like, you know what, let me just try something different. My friends have been telling me about computer science. I've never done computer science. I only had about two years' experience just using a computer on and off. But I was like, I want to try this thing. It felt like the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> my school system was called a block plan, where we take only one class for three and a half weeks, and you never see that class again. I always felt like I was a day behind, like in my first two classes of computer science. It was pretty tough. Fortunately, I did hang on. I mean, in my, being in the United States, I was learning with, you know, like a majority of the students I was with were, were white students. So my my feeling of inadequacy, feeling maybe I am the best son, 
were, were, were creeping in now and then. I graduated from college and I started applying for jobs. I applied to a lot of different jobs. And one of those jobs was Google. I found an advertisement online. I was like, all right, let me just try it out. Someone got back to me. I was telling my friends that I'm just only doing this for the experience, like, to just to go through the interview. Six months later, after working through my, my interview, I got the job. Now, one thing I have, you know, like seen that had helped me to be where I am now is to be able to step outside my comfort zone. I have realized that being able to, to, to dream beyond the label that I had at the moment has allowed me to achieve what I have achieved right now. I remember when I, when, when I was, I just graduated from, from like, when I just finished my Form 5, my brother, my older brother told me that it was actually possible to earn the amount of money that I'm earning now. At the time, it felt like a lot, a lot of money. So I said to him, what would I do with so much money? And he said, yeah, well, you can help our siblings. And that's exactly what I did when I first started working at Google uh, in 2013. Three of my siblings are doing uh, the, the, their third year at universities in South Africa, including the University of Bath. It has been through this experience of being able to live a life th that is beyond the level I've been given, that, I have, that I've been able to, to impact my family. We started a, an organization in 2005 where we motivate students in Swaziland. The name of the organization is called Young Climber. So when we first started, we were just going around school. It's actually possible for you to do the same thing that we have just done. Students write to us uh, at some point telling us, hey, I heard your story and it really motivated me. A student wrote to me about a year ago, she was going off to, to Norway to study um, like, uh, like her international baccalaureate. Just in my home area, I'm aware of four students who have been able to, to get the story and be able to apply it, apply it to themselves and be able to say, hey, there's a change within me too. One of the students is actually studying aerospace engineering in the United States in one of the top schools, Embry Wrigley University. Another one is studying medicine in Turkey. Two of the, two, the last two students in my home area are just a stone throw away from my my house, and they were both in the national top 10. It's, it's these kind of stories that, are now, that is, are now motivating me to believe that, you know, people just need to hear that they actually do what, have what it takes to make it. Imagine if this kind of story were to spread throughout Swaziland, throughout Africa, and around the world, where people can start realizing that all they have is within them to make things happen. In Swaziland, more than 60% of the population are living below the poverty line. 12,000 of the students that sit down for their national exam form five, only 5% 5 of them are able to get, qualify for the national scholarship. And then what happens to the 90%? What if those students were to realize that they don't have to look out to someone else for their answers, but just look inside them to make things happen? This takes me to where I am right now, because I can imagine some of you thinking, I would like to wake up this giant within me too. I'm still waking up mine. Let me tell you where I am in my journey. I don't think being at Google, I have arrived. That is someone else's business. I need to think about my own business. <laughs> there are some practical advice 
that I have learned that I would like to share to myself and you too. One of the things that I'm, I'm trying to apply is, and, and I've learned this from work, is the idea that if you're trying to do something, a big project, don't think about how you're going to solve the big project, but think about how you're going to start small. And they call this the angel methodology in programming. So you start with a smaller piece that will allow you to learn very quickly and, 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 and iterate. And then you keep on improving on that until you are able to solve the bigger problem. Trying to solve the bigger problem as a whole will, will, will not allow for that. You spend too much time, too many resources, and by the time you are done, you actually realize that you have spent so much effort solving for the wrong problem. I have also learned that to be able to, to, to do all of these things, I have to be able to learn quickly and figure out if something works or it doesn't work. I, I, there's a favorite quote that I, I, I heard that says, don't cling to a mistake just because you spent too much time making it. And it's, well, lastly, I have actually learned that I have to go out there, make things happen for myself. Having someone else go the extra mile for me is a nice to have. That thing used to happen back at home when my mom was around. She's still alive, but you know, now I don't stay with her. <laughs> <laughs> and so just to wrap up, I want to say that I am motivating myself and I'm motivating you to think about that your dreams are actually possible. You have what it takes to solve your own problems and to solve the problems of the people around you. For me, that look, the way that looked like to me is starting with my siblings and starting with my home area. So now let's go out there and raise the giants within everyone and help people divorce their own labels and outgrow all of that. Thank you.